let's wait for maybe a few more people uh, to join. Uh, yes. Do you have time after meeting around maybe 10, 15 minutes? Yes, uh, but I, I have next meeting at uh, 6.30. So I, I need to, um, if, if it will go approach this uh, time, I will need to cut the meeting and before we, we can chat. Okay, so uh, I'm sending to you some initial figures. So the application, uh, also I need to So um, yeah, we, we are still waiting for more people to, to join. And um, I believe we are going to uh, shift the... Um, oh, Stephen, nice, nice, nice meeting you. Thank, thank you for joining. We are going to shift um, the knowledge transfer section uh, by uh, Yuvun from today to uh, next Tuesday, because there is something much more uh, interesting so, uh, to, to, to discuss in the research. But uh, even would you, would you be uh, interested in av available make a like quick slides on, on this knowledge transfer? Yep, thank you, thank you. So. Um, And um, we also may need to um, yes. Uh, you you may oh hello Aaron nice uh, seeing you connected. Oh you are still in in uh, Wisconsin right? So um, we are uh, updating schedule a little bit. The uh, uh, part that was planned for uh, today by you uh, for knowledge transfer is uh, moved for next meeting. And um, because you is going to present something uh, emergent uh, research results that are 
uh, interesting to discuss. And um, during the meeting or after, you may want to uh, sign up for the remaining parts of this uh, knowledge transfer thing. And uh, I believe since uh, Fatima is not uh, hasn't done uh, non collinear spin, this things that I'm highlighting right now will be to share like uh, um, between uh, David and Aaron and myself. So you may want to to cover this uh, script. Basically, what to do is. Um, Mm, how to how to run non adiabatic molecular dynamics with uh, spin orbit coupling? So um, I'll make a little soft start, uh, mumbling something about spin orbit, and uh, then uh, David will uh, share how to uh, practical steps on how to do the uh, ground state non collinear spin uh, calculations in VASP and uh, Aaron will give some uh, instructions how to compute spectra in presence of the uh, non collinear spin and, and spin orbit. Okay. So, what what I'm going to do now is not a competitive presentation, so please do not learn from me uh, about style of presentations. It's not my strongest, but uh, since we, we need to go forward, it's just something. So, um, all of us are uh, doing one or another form of uh, density function of theory calculations, and uh, the typical approach that we do is uh, singlet with no account of spin at all or um, so-called spin polarized DFT when uh, uh, an electron may have spin uh, up and sp or spin down. There is a class of materials and class of problems when one needs to go beyond this uh, limit where the uh, spin of an electron can uh, have orientation different from uh, from the selected axis, not only up or down, but uh, to the side. And uh, here I'm just showing a couple of uh, figures uh, that pop up in the internet on this keyword. Uh, so. It, uh, it's not quite uh, relevant, I'm just uh, showing some images how to start thinking of it. So, um, since each atom in, in the lattice, if we uh, describe solid, has several electrons, one can add together spin on a single uh, atom and uh, make uh, an average spin, average magnetization vector, which uh, generally can deviate from, uh, let's say, Z axis. And this is especially important for magnetic materials like uh, atoms with unpaired spins, like, for example, iron. And let me check. Uh, okay. Uh, for example, iron. And then um, there is a need and uh, by now we do have practical tools uh, to describe not only the magnetization of a certain atom or magnetization of, uh, of the whole cell, but distribution of spin density, which means uh, when we do our regular uh, calculations, we are thinking of the electron density and electron wave function, just localized or not localized in a specific area of space. But now, if uh, we allow electron to have spin, it can, uh, and the spin can be oriented at different uh, angles, then uh, at each point of space, we need to uh, have two things. The probability that electron is present there, and the direction of spin 
uh, for for this fraction of an electron that is uh, localized in a specific area of space. And uh, I kept browsing uh, over internet for this uh, um, for figures to illustrate this idea. And by the way, this little figure and link below is by uh, authors of uh, Wasp software, so they know what they do, and we, we are following them. And uh, there is a chunk of literature where people start to, uh, where people explore the uh, range of effects where this uh, direction of uh, spin density gives interesting physical effects. So we, we are not studying it, but just uh, uh, being aware that uh, there is an activity where this uh, spin vector doesn't necessarily uh, originate from a single point, but may create uh, vortices and more complicated, uh, complicated structures. Um, in case we obtain skills in running uh, quantum chemistry software in um, finding this uh, spin density through computational chemistry software, um, uh, we come to, we are coming to the next problem. The standard um, packages for computational chemistry are a little bit behind the uh, sharp edge and do not include tools to plot total density or orbitals with this uh, spin orientation feature. So if one plans to do it, and we may eventually do it, then uh, one needs either to run right uh, uh, personal code or use packages. For for example, in the MATLAB, there is a, a utility uh, called Kiver, which uh, reads the vector field and draws this swirl of arrows showing uh, where they are located. So, uh, in this example from the MATLAB um, Menu, it, it uses just analytical formula to plot it as, a, as an example, and it is a field uh, corresponding approximately to the um, electric field in a, in a dipole. But uh, if one imports this information about orientation of spin from electronic structure calculation, one probably can uh, use the uh, MATLAB to do this in two or three, three dimensions. So, as a little beginning and uh, as a little start I'm going to show a couple of slides uh, from the paper uh, written and published by uh, Hugo Yao, so a, a colleague and a friend of uh, Yoon. So um, he did, he was brave enough to explore options in the uh, VASP software that allow to follow these features and there was an explicit motivation to look on the uh, non-collinear spin. In addition to the motivation of uh, thinking about this uh, spin density, like charge density distribution with orientation of spin, there is uh, another, another feature. Uh, in heavy elements where electrons are rotating around nuclei with uh, velocities not approaching the speed of light but uh, being comparable to speed of light maybe like one percent uh, there is a high value of angular momentum and this angular momentum of rotating electron interacts with its own spin and through this effect the spin stops being a good uh, quantum number. And uh, in this situation, when spin stops uh, being a good quantum number, it can change orientation and generally flip. 
and uh, states with different orientation of spin can uh, experience transitions. So, uh, spin is not a good quantum number. And uh, this effect is uh, specifically pronounced in the uh, lanthanide ions, which are at the closer to the bottom of, of, the, of the periodic uh, uh, table. So if one focuses on these materials, these uh, features of non-collinear spin are needed to be taken into account. So to make a little connection to uh, the images at, at the beginning, let me show a figure from uh, this paper by Hugo. Uh, by Hugo. So, um, by the time the paper was uh, published, and even now, we didn't have and we still do not have the tool for efficient uh, for efficient plotting of this uh, Kiver uh, data. But one instead, one can uh, uh, practice. One can practice plotting the components of uh, of this uh, spin density as scalar fields. So, if we do have the uh, in each point of space, if you do have a projection of uh, spin onto x-axis, y-axis, and uh, z-axis, we can just plot this uh, density as, as, uh, for this x-projection as function of position in space, mx, my of r, and uh, mz of r. So this is not as beautiful for representation, but um, this would be a measure of, um, this would correspond to, uh, to the skiver plot. So since they are growing simultaneously, it probably would correspond to almost equivalent distribution in all directions. So like vectors going from center. But there is, if one follows uh, images carefully, they're not uh, ideally spherical. So one can identify some shapes and see that uh, in uh, some specific direction, there is, a, there is more. Uh, so the spin uh, vector is uh, changing its angle. And by comparing absolute value of this distribution in each point of space, one can see the magnetization. And this magnetization differs from, from the total density. So this is just a little uh, teaser. And uh, the three-dimensional distributions um, are just starting point to think. But again, they are not the main thing unless we want to deal with uh, magnetic phase. The main thing is uh, orthogonality and transition between eigenstates for heavy elements when spin is not a good quantum number. So uh, the images shown here are uh, this uh, mx, my, and mz uh, fields. And uh, at one day, we may plot uh, similar results as a this Kiver vector field, which corresponds to this M vector as function of position. So in each point of space, we need to draw a little vector. And um, in order to reach uh, this level of detailization, in order to have the spin density with certain direction, one needs to depart from our uh, previous vision of electron density as a single uh, um, one component object, like 
rho as function of position and one even needs to depart from the vision of density for alpha electrons and density for beta electrons to have these three components we need something richer something more advanced and uh, i am presenting kind of uh, uh, in the reverse order going from observables to main uh, things so this components of uh, spin density are computed from the um, components of the density for for this calculation which is called non collinear spin so in this representation uh, density uh, always in, in each point of space space has four components which are labeled by uh, spin index and uh, this spin indices here and there they do not coincide so by uh, so each spin index uh, can take value alpha and beta or plus and minus one half and then by uh, multiplying two by two it will be four possible components so if one uh, um, add together diagonal components when one is obtaining total density if one uh, adding together uh, off diagonal components one is get, getting x projection if one subtracts off diagonal one is getting y and if one subtracts diagonal one is getting uh, z projection of the of the spin and um, this um, components can be just stored in in, in a matrix and this is a requirement to deal with uh, magnetization so instead of one density as in for singlets or two densities as one does for uh, polarized dft one is having this uh, four components two diagonal components and two off diagonal so uh, what they are and um, i'm going to very briefly without much details review uh, some elements of the dft contram procedure where we have a self-consistency cycle between uh, density orbital and potential so regularly we have one density uh, by uh, that determines energy and then by practicing function of derivative from uh, the uh, energy over density one is getting potential and then by using this potential in the constram orbital equation one is getting orbitals and then from orbitals one can compose density and then one repeats this uh, cycle over again so how the situation looks in the representations of this representation of this non-collinear spin so before we were using just absolute value square of the orbital or just orbital uh, star in point r times orbital without star in point r and then we were uh, making summation over i and telling that it is a it is a density in point r here the situation is get is getting more complicated we still have one index but we do have two components of the orbitals alpha like spin up and beta spin down but both of these components for orbitals um, it's it's not different orbitals as we used to have in the uh, spin polarized dft those two alpha and beta uh, spin uh, components of orbital are the part of one non-collinear spin uh, uh, orbital so one writes them as a little vector with each element depends on uh, position and this um, two component vector looks if we would if you wouldn't have dependence on position it would be a, a minimalistic quantum vector for a spin up or down but since this uh, spin depends on position uh, one calls it spinner uh, composed of two words spin and orbital 
So um, spinner orbital is not quite uh, correct, although it is easier to read. So spin orbital. Um, and then these components of, of orbitals are used to generate uh, this uh, four components of the density. Now, how, and uh, uh, I'm um, bringing it back once again, so density functional theory procedure includes uh, self-consistency cycle between three objects, density, potential, and orbitals, which are cycle-wise uh, connect to each other. So um, we do need to get a uh, um, basic idea what is going on, the um, expression for orbitals, how to compute them, and expression for potential, which is definitely needed for uh, in order to get the um, to get the or, uh, equation to, to get orbitals. Also, a little comment on the on these components. So unlike uh, spin polarized uh, situation, they are not independent, and uh, they are uh, part of one object of the spinner. Uh, so the orthogonality of different spinners is uh, expressed in a, in a little bit different way compared to what we uh, used to have. So uh, in a regular way, we just have orbital i with star and orbital j with star integrated and get uh, Dirac uh, delta. So if they coincide one, if they do not coincide zero. Here it is um, com again combination of i and j, but one does it pairwise for, uh, uh, for um, the alpha components of the of the uh, and for beta components of spinners i and j and uh, if uh, the spinners are found through correct eigenvalue problem they obey this orthogonality condition so when uh, setting up orthogonality between spinner orbitals now uh, where the orbitals are coming from. Huh. I think there is a uh, there is a missing slide. So I'll quickly just draw things. So um, one is. Uh, practicing the functional derivative of the total energy minus kinetic uh, over the um, different components of uh, density. So if one takes a uh, functional derivative over alpha alpha, it will be potential component alpha alpha. If one uh, makes uh, same thing over uh, rho alpha beta, it will be a component of the uh, potential alpha beta. So by practicing it, uh, one can obtain four components of the um, of the potential. So instead of one potential, there is uh, there are four components of the potential, and this uh, four components of the potential are entering into the analog of uh, orbital Kuhn-Sham orbital equations that generates the spinners. So um, I am showing this uh, equation in two forms. So below green line, it is a, a complete equation in the form of a matrix, in a matrix form. Above, it's just components for uh, alpha and for uh, beta. So the unknown, the spinner is composed of unknown components uh, alpha and beta, each of which depends on position. And one needs to find them simultaneously. So, uh, 
So in order to find them simultaneously, one uh, sets up the eigenvalue problem, where one needs to find this uh, vectors, eigenvectors, and uh, vectors, and eigenvalue. So typically we have just operator, which is scalar, not, not, a, not a matrix in the sense of components. And here we have uh, each, because the um, unknown vector has two components, we have also uh, the, um, each kinetic and potential energy has a form of two by two matrices. So uh, for kinetic energy, uh, it looks diagonal, a standard gradient thing, and for uh, potential energy, it uh, it is a matrix two by two, uh, which serves a role of uh, mixing alpha and beta components. So because the off diagonal elements are non-zero, the alpha and beta components become dependent on each other if you look on the mechanics of uh, of these equations so um, uh, this is uh, highlighted here so if one uh, goes over on the first uh, component if one uh, um, like row by column rule for uh, for this matrix row by column so one uh, making summation of uh, of these uh, two elements in the matrix, um, and then they will be so both alpha and beta components will be equal to alpha to alpha component. In the same for the second component. So this. Uh, of diagonal elements of the um, exchange correlation potential mix alpha and beta component and are responsible for the situation when uh, spin is not a good quantum number. If we return to upper three rows, uh, two, three rows of periodic table and uh, uh, practice regular spin polarized DFT, then this off diagonal uh, elements will be uh, neglected and alpha and beta um, components will be not uh, mixed and spin is a good quantum number so few more slides on the overview as soon as we get the eigenvalues of the spinners we may analyze this eigenvalues in the same way as we do usually to scroll the whole energy range and see at which uh, energy interval we have more of the states. And uh, here is just a little example. So uh, for the spin polarized DFT, we have uh, alpha and beta things. And for non-collinear spin, we have only one uh, list of energies, E sub i, without alpha and beta components. But if we look for um, range of a systems uh, through spin polarized and non-collinear spin, the qualitative trends will be comparable. Not exact, but comparable. Like uh, um, in this sequence of, of elements, in uh, like dopants and, and crystal lattice, we do have um, states contributed by impurity near the uh, conduction band edge, and they are filled. And if one um, looks into a different element, uh, again, near the edge of uh, conduction band, two states are filled, and it shifts uh, to the uh, lower energy two states field near conduction you see conduction band and they are moving towards lower energy three are field and they move further to the lower energy so 
overall trends are um, comparable. And this tells that as a little justification that uh, non-collinear spin doesn't dramatically change energies. But instead of two, com two uh, non-collinear spin orbitals, it creates a spinner as a single entity, and it is more um, natural way to describe electronic structure of heavy elements. And a uh, few more things. Since spin is not a good quantum number, transitions between spin orbitals, uh, which can have different uh, spin, are possible. And uh, these uh, transitions can be optical when one practices the uh, transition dipole between uh, spinners, the spinner is two components, and transition dipole is just matrix element of position operator. So uh, this uh, equation, uh, I just copy-pasted uh, from Aaron's paper. And um, so it is uh, transitions due to light. And uh, transitions may also happen uh, due to dissipation of energy into uh, vibration, into vibrations. And then one needs to practice non-adiabatic transitions in a similar way as we do it uh, for singlet uh, calculations. And here I borrow it from uh, equations from 2019 paper of Aaron. So uh, in non-adiabatic transitions between spinners, uh, one compares them uh, computed at different stages of the dynamics and uh, one needs to mm, compose this uh, combination of um, components of spinners at different instants of time. So with this I am uh, completing this little introduction. Uh, I will be happy to discuss and answer any questions. And uh, next in line is uh, David. Okay. So uh, I cannot insist on questions to myself. So uh, David, would you like to share screen yourself or would you like me to uh, flip your slides? Doesn't matter to me. Okay. Um, if you are in the on campus, maybe you can uh, take the control and, and flip slides. It will be quite high uh, resolution. So what I'm presenting today is a basic overview of how to run the non-collinear calculations in LASK and uh, some of the observable, observ observables you can get from it. So what, what you need to actually run this is you need your standard input files, the postcard, the end card, the K point, and the pod card. And we're also going to need the charge card file from our spin restricted or spin polarized run. And you can also use the wave card, assuming you use the last understores STD executable when you ran that job. If you use the gamma executable, the wave card won't work for this. Mm -hmm. So you need to modify your in-car in -car for it to work for this. You need to add 
add the L S orbit equals true, which um, is what includes the spin orbit coupling interactions. Um, the L non collinear equals true, which runs the non collinear job. And you need I charge equal. What was that? You need I charge equals 11. And this is what um, causes RAS to read in your charge car file. And you also want to do this as a single point calculation. And you need to make sure that you use the VAS NCL executable, which I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, is the in our Cori.sh file. And it's at the bottom, and I have it highlighted in red in the, my example. So at this point, you could then run your non collinear job. Um, so, uh, you, David, is it, is it okay to ask uh, as we go? Uh, so, um, how, through your experience, uh, how critical is to um, read to read this supplied uh, charge car uh, and uh, and uh, wave car? Can one remove this I charge equal eleven, remove charge car, and remove wave car? Would the uh, VASP and NCL work anyway, or or it will generate some errors? Like, what is your uh, feeling. In, my, in my experience, the wave car is not necessary. I um, and if you did it with with the VASP under sort of GMA executable, it's going to give you an error. Um, I've never tried it without using the charge car, mm -hmm. so I'm not honestly sure if that would give an error or not. Okay. Uh, let's ask. Uh, let me let me ask Aaron and and Yuvun, uh, What would uh, happen if one doesn't supply uh, charge uh, charge car? So the job would run. Uh -huh. You feed in the charge car. It just helps. Like the calculations run quicker. Uh huh. And it's. I think in the manual they say it's the total charge density is constrained. So it's like you, like between the spin polarized and the non collinear, the total charge density mm -hmm. stays fixed. Okay, so it is not it is not forbidden to run without uh, wave car and charge car. Right. But it will be uncert uh, less certainty. It may uh, start with uh, very random uh, distribution of density and s converge slower. Or, or the, uh, mm -hmm. other, would it would it give drastically different energy? Or like, uh, um, what would be the consequences if one misses to use uh, charge car from from spin polarized? Um, I guess in principle they should reach the same energy. But I know for my manganese system, when I was doing couplings, mm -hmm. like after like it would be unstable. Like it wouldn't the calculations wouldn't converge if there wasn't a charge car supplied. Okay. I think for very high spin systems, it helps to supply it. So there is no hard uh, requirement to supply charge car and wave car, but to stay out of trouble, uh, it's safer to, to provide them. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're trying to do the calculation hundreds of times, it's like there's significant speed up. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you.
If there are no more comments on this aspect, David, please uh, consider to continue. For um, setting the polarization, then we're we're inputting this from the results for a spin polarized calculation. So what we want to do is we want to define the multiplicity in our our spin polarized con uh, spin polarized calculation, mm -hmm. which we do with the n up down peg, mm -hmm. and then we would um, transfer in this charge car and use the i charge eleven peg again to run the the spin orbit calculation from this. Okay, let me ask uh, another thing. So. Um... If I, well, not I, but someone develops a dream to completely give up uh, uh, all VASP executables uh, except VASP and CL, like do live life only in VASP and CL executable, uh, is there a way to set up magnetization rather than uh, uh, setting up the value of n up down? Is there a way to explicitly set up magnetization? Um, did you saw uh, the um, um, this way in the manual, and did you uh, believe that it is practical? If I remember, I type correctly. I can't type correctly. If I remember, there is an executable. I want to say it's Magmon, mm -hmm. but that's not giving me any results as I type it into the internet quick. Um, okay. Uh, apparently, it's Magmon. That's why I'm not uh -huh. getting results. <laughs> so, mag magnetic moment. Um, yeah. Aaron, did you try this uh, keyword and was, was it uh, helpful? I guess I never played with those keywords too much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess. So uh, I do not see anything wrong in uh, borrowing charge car with magnetization from uh, uh, spin polarized calculation, but uh, uh, if one grows as a big supporter of non-collinear calculations. Uh, just the question, is it possible to do everything in uh, in the uh, VASP and CO and nothing else? So yeah, it should be possible if you really want to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please continue. So now, once you have your your um, job run, you can make your density of states. Um, to do this, you need a healthy states file. And then you're going to use the... Oh, so wait, 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 wait. How do you get healthy states file? You make an energy pop file and assuming the energy pop file is well, you make an input overlap file so you can do the states file but by, by manually parsing records from the out car or you can uh, if you have some desire to do that yeah but uh, do you remember the script that uh, that makes it automatically extract en underscore energy underscore pop dot exe if I remember correctly. Okay. Okay. Yep. Good. Um, so you need you need an in, input overlap file, which is the input for that script, which pops out an energy pop file, um, and then you copy the energy pop to states for your states file. Okay. 
then you need to run the script, the dress das, das norm NCL. Mm -hmm. And that's going to give you your dot stop fermi output. You're going to need your number of states, uh, the energy range you're looking at, fermi energy, number of atoms, number of electrons. So it, it works like our standard dot script. And then you use the new plot to actually plot your your DOS, and I just copied in one of the generic new pro DOS scripts here. Okay. Uh, would it be correct to say that from the practical uh, point of view, the analysis of the output from uh, spin, non-collinear spin data is the same as for uh, singlet? Or, so it is... So it is uh, simpler than spin polarized. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's effectively the, the same as uh, as singlet. Mm -hmm. And you get a nice looking DOS graph out as I showed here, and this is from my n equals one hybrid model. Okay. And to make orbitals, you're going to use the in-card from your spin orbit job, and you're going to add a few more lines to it. Um, the L par B equals true, L sub B equals true, and the E, I, and T equals the range that energy range that you're looking for for your orbitals and then you would run this job and you it would give you a list of par charge files that you can make for your orbitals so uh, a couple of technical questions when yeah. you do single point uh, calculations uh, uh, one needs to in in your uh, previous slides you you were like slide three. You were mentioning that there are specific uh, keywords like uh, n non-collinear true, ls orbit, and uh, so does one need to include the uh, same uh, keywords into the in car if you are uh, targeting to convert wave car into par charge? want to say yes I always have okay so it, it doesn't hurt to include them <laughs> I don't uh, think it's probably strictly necessary <laughs> any any other opinions okay um, so David, is there any anything else on on the orbitals? No, that was so it pops out par charge, and then you would visualize it with VMD or like mm -hmm. you would any other par charge file. Okay, okay. Then then I have another quick uh, quick question. Um, so the orbitals that uh, you are showing. Uh, seems that it is only total density. It doesn't include any information about uh, spin wave. About uh, although each orbital is a spinner, you are just plotting orbitals in the same style as for singlets. So what is happening to the spin information? Where it is? Uh, is it explicitly hidden or explicitly shown? Um, can you comment comment on this? Or or if you are not sure, just make your guess what is going on. Well, I'm not sure. I would guess that it's explicitly hidden. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, Darren, would you like to add a comment on this? Um, yeah, I don't know where it would be in the way of car. Okay, it's it's a no. uh -huh, correct answer. <laughs> okay, so um, mm -hmm. the charge car writes extra data out for like X, Y, and Z mm -hmm. activations. But yeah, I'm not sure. If, I don't think they do the same with the wave car. Um, the authors of the software do not want to share any data that is not um, double proved for 300 times and therefore they they kind of hide uh, magnetization for individual orbitals they pro uh, as you correctly told they um, provide total density and three magnetization projections in the charge car so for the total density um, uh, in singlet charged car contains only one segment of data. In spin polarized uh, DFT, charged car contains two segments for spin alpha and spin beta. And for non-collinear, charged car contains uh, four segments for the thing for this uh, total density, MX, MY, and MZ uh, components. But uh, if one wants to work and to describe spin uh, a polarization for a specific orbital one needs to read the uh, spinner uh, orbital from the wave car and then convert it from momentum space to cartesian space uh, by additional handwritten code the uh, by uh, automatically is not provided and probably mm, something is not perfect with this orbital so they decided not to uh, give this data to users Okay. Uh, I think in the pro car, they write out, like for each band, they give a magnetization. Uh huh. But it's still not magnetization over space. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. So let me invite everyone to uh, give a round of applause to David. Yeah. And many thanks. And. Uh, it's a it's a useful uh, in, information that uh, will be used in many generations. And uh, the next turn is for Aaron. Uh, would you like to present yourself, or you want like you you may try, and if there will be delays, I can be a backup. Uh, Aaron, I think your microphone was uh, muted by some reason. At least on it my. Was. Uh huh. Okay. That's no, good. Okay, so my talk is just a continuation of what David presented previously. So he worked uh, up to plotting density states. And then if you were going through the workflow, the next step would be to look at absorption spectra the model that you looked at. And so he uses a lot of the same steps that David provided. So to do spectra, the only input files that you really need are input overlap, which is just three lines, and only two of them matter. So essentially you provide what range of orbitals you want to look at. So if you're homo, in this case, it's like 2,800. You can do like 50 states above and below. 
But if you just figure that out manually, like for each system, and then put it in the orbital indices that you want to look at. And then you have your input overlap file in the same directory as your wave car. And then in the bin, there's a script that will read in the wave car. So it's just read wave car spinner healthy. I think there's there's a bunch of different versions, but I think this is the most reliable and up to date. Oh, uh, quick, quick question. Uh, I remember uh, in um, since NERSC is being updated and uh, some of these uh, codes need to be recompiled from time to time. Does it uh, work uh, immediately, or one needs to reset the libraries? So yeah, whenever NERSC feels like a complete shutdown or or updates, there's software it's like you need to recompile the script uh, right right now did you check that it works without any uh, recompilation or updating libraries when when uh, is the last time when you accessed this script and found it working like april was the last time i used it oh okay I used it about no. okay and you do not use uh, additional line uh, for like uh, it was not compiled with uh, GNU Fortran. It's uh, one doesn't need to change libraries between uh, different versions of compilers. If you do not, uh, uh, if if what I'm telling uh, sounds strange, then it is a good sign. Yeah, it's. I've never had that error. Okay. So once it's compiled, it works indefinitely until it doesn't. And, and a crazy, sorry to interrupt, a crazy question. What if you apply this uh, executable to the wave car generated without, uh, with regular executable? Oh, sorry, with, for, for the wave car computed in a singlet or in spin polarization? Would it give an error or would it work as well? Um, it would give some sort of error. I don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would reject it pretty quickly. And then, yeah, I guess if it ever does need to be recompiled, I think like the the source code is read wave car spinner. Got that? Okay. So it's let's mean similarly. Mm -hmm. So you run the script. If it runs correctly, you should get three. Well, I guess you should get four different output files. I forgot to mention one of them. The three of them will be there's OS, STR, and then two letters. Mm -hmm. So the letters correspond to valence, will be the valence and heat of conduction. So within the VV file, those correspond to valence band to valence band transition. TC is conduction band to conduction band. But for absorption spectrum, the one that we're most concerned about is valence to conduction. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the text that's shown below is just the head file, the head, the BC file. And the columns correspond to orbital indices, so IJ, transition energy, the energies of the orbitals, the components of transition dipoles, and then occupation, the very last one. Mm -hmm. So that's the output file. The two plots. This file, I guess, one option is you could just plot stick files or stick plots from the oscillator strain file but to generate something that looks like an absorption spectrum. We have to convert these uh, oscillator strain files to spectrum files. So to do that, you just copy your oscillator strain to BC to big oscillator strain or big OS underscore strain. 
and you want to make sure that you remove the header text file. So, so after you copy it, just you want to delete the first line. Otherwise, uh -huh. uh, you'll get an error when you try to run the script. We have big OS underscore string. And to generate spectrum, there is a code in the bin spectrum underscore m underscore so soc3 and it's fairly similar to all the other spectrum files or spectrum codes that last for number of transitions and you get that from getting the link of your big os strength file the wc os strength and it'll give you a line of numbers and one of them you input here uh, they'll ask for an energy range to look at. So it's like, if you're not thinking, just do something broad from like one to eight. Uh, they'll ask for a broadening parameter and an index of the uh, home ball window. And everything, if everything runs correctly, it could output a spectrum. Uh, and then the plot that. So, uh, Aaron, can, can you just uh, stop and uh, make a little? Um, so this spectrum underscore IMP underscore SOC3 is, uh, differs from the one we, we use uh, for Singlet by the format it reads uh, the uh, oscillator strings. So it reads additional uh, columns in this format. Uh, yes. I guess it's, I don't think it's additional, it's just different columns. Okay. So, like in the other OS strength files, I think the oscillator strengths are... Oh, the order, the, the not the number, but the order of columns is swapped. Right, the so occupations yeah. and uh, XYZ projections are uh, swapped. Mm, yes. Okay. So in all of these oscillator strings are column six, but mm -hmm. they're different for previous versions. Okay, yep, thank you. But yeah, that's, that's the only difference in the code that generates spectrum. So once the spectrum file is generated, there are various new file underscore SVD files in the bin. So you can just copy them, copy one of them to your the main directory. And then you new plot to plot it. And so I guess the only variations in plotting is if you use columns two and three, that will plot your units of energy will be in EV. But you wanted to plot in wavelengths, you would just change those two to a one. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially the only the different variations that you can plot your spectrum in. So this last slide is just a compilation of different um, x axes and broadening parameters. So on the left, uh, both of these figures are plotted in nanometer and they have slightly varying broadening parameters. So you can see this top one, uh, the slowest energy peak, kind of merges into the higher energy transition. Whereas if you provide a smaller broadening, that peak becomes more narrow. So that's something you can just play with and tell you what the way that your spectrum looks. And the figures on the right, those are the same idea, but they're just plotted in EV instead of uh, wavelengths. And yeah, that's the last slide I have to show. Okay, please join me in thanking Aaron for an important presentation. So, uh, Questions are welcome, and I, I see there is a typed question from Yulun. 
for spin orbit calculations does anyone has the solution for error EDDAV code to ZH EGV failed um. so ZH EGV is a, a um, eigenvalue unit so it happens when the matrix uh, has zero determinant or um, not comfortable for diagonalization and um, I do not have solution but maybe it is what uh, Aaron was mentioning like if there is no pre-made uh, charge current wave car and then uh, it may come into numerical instability Aaron would you uh, argue or agree or provide some different vision um, I know I've run across it before I guess like there's not a single fix that shows up in like a lot of different situations I guess so this it happens like as it runs through the like the minimization algorithm right Oh, uh, Yun, your your microphone is muted. Yeah, I, I guess I tried different method, and I still get the same error, no matter which optimization I use. Did you start yeah. from geometry optimized uh, without uh, non-collinear spin? Say again. Um, are you trying? to optimize from scratch from hand drawn molecule or you use pre-optimized model as input geometry um, i use wave car and uh, charge car from previous calculations hmm. okay in, in my experience you get that when the wave car is not being read in correctly and the only ways I've ever been able to find to fix it is to either find a different wave car or you can try playing with the N core or N par parameters in the wind car, but that doesn't always seem to work. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't, does it, this uh, error happens uh, before electronic structure cycles or in the middle of them? Um, I guess it depends. Sometimes before the first step, I saw this kind of arrow. And sometimes I, I see it after five times, the okay. five steps. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. And I try to just decrease the number of electronic steps uh -huh. to five. Just to save the wave car and the conga and the charge car, but it doesn't work. Huh. Interesting. I, I remember it, it did work uh, but for some other systems. Huh. Okay. Is it a fairly high spin system? So basically, I'll, I just have a power sky slab and then attached to some metal. Mm hmm. So it, um, the images that I was showing um, just as a, as a teaser uh, come from the uh, area of magnetic frustration when uh, the system uh, is in very unstable uh, configuration where like uh, degeneracy between uh, slightly different spin orientations when uh, it, it stops optim optimizing because it doesn't know where to go and uh, if it is like more than one uh, magnetic ion it, it may come to this thing okay. um, I, I do not have strict 
confirmed uh, answer, but maybe if one uh, uh, mimics high intensity magnetic field when everything will be more homogeneous, like start with highest possible magnetization in spin pol polarized or add more magnetic ions to make it ferromagnetic so that this little uh, additional ion will be just as an impurity on the uh, background of strong field. It's, it's not computational, it's just physical, uh, physical insight. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I do have a question uh, to ever well, not, not only to Aaron, but to, to everyone. Um, in which applications this uh, spin polarized, uh, non not spin polarized, non collinear spin and spin torment coupling uh, calculations are, are needed? And uh, the question is uh, originating from the following reason uh, Fatima, uh, Amir, and uh, Stephen, who is uh, also visiting us, um, have their own projects. And the question is like, uh, is there need to take into account spin orbit in uh, conjugated polymer projects for Amir? Is there a necessity to take into account spin orbit in graphene or bismuth telluride uh, two-dimensional materials? Or is there a necessity to take into account spin orbit coupling in uh, metal organic complexes that uh, Stephen is uh, uh, focusing on? Like, what is the criterion to, to, uh, to be or not to be, to use or not to use uh, uh, non collinear spin or spin orbit coupling? I can tell you that there's a deal with cathodes that have lead in them. And lead is like one of the prototypical spin orbit coupling. Like atoms. So one one criterion is uh, if something goes uh, lower than fourth row, then it makes sense to like if it, it gives fifth row of the periodic table, then use it for sure. At least try, and if it if it, uh, if it works, then it it, it could be useful. Um, in periodic uh, like some organic dyes without metals uh, exhibit uh, phosphorescence, like uh, firefly uh, bugs, or um, transition from singlet to triplet uh, is associated with emission, and it happens in some molecules where there are no uh, heavy atoms. So would it be also a criterion uh, to use non-collinear spin and spin orbit? Uh, I want to say yes, but I, uh, I do not have enough ex experience in uh, doing it for for all possible systems but maybe it would be interesting to try so uh, it's an interesting exercise that may give some benefits so um, and if it is a um, reaction of uh, adduct anion as adsorbent on the carbon nanotube that uh, switches that may switch between singlet and triplet multiplicity along the reaction, uh, it could be an interesting uh, approach to try even if uh, all elements are like light elements like uh, carbons and, and nitrogens. Um, if uh, Steven is uh, listening to us, uh, so for metal organic complexes, uh, from uh, experimental lab of uh, Professor Lin Fang Sun. They are show infrared emission with a change of uh, uh, spin multiplicity. So for those objects, uh, spin orbit coupling would be very much uh, appropriate, especially if you do computations with, uh, with VASP. Okay, 
Um, I'm going. Let please uh, thank uh, uh, together with me David and and Aaron. So before we go to uh, emergent new results by uh, uh, Yulun, let's um, quickly sign up for the next uh, meeting. I'm going to share share the screen. So uh, basically, we need to chop these five subjects between uh, two and half uh, people. Like I, I will count like half of a person, and uh, Aaron and, and David are counted as a full strength uh, uh, intellectual power. Um, I, I know how to chop it between two people if I do not present anything. Uh, I would suggest uh, David does last two and Aaron does fir first, first three. But uh, if you have an idea, if you, if you see it differently or... Um, oh, <laughs> just to pretend uh, in the fairness, I will take the, the easiest one. So, um, w would it be okay if uh, Aaron does first two and uh, David does last two? Do you s that works for me. Okay. That's fine. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah, and uh, after next meeting, uh, we all uh, will be equipped to do um, non-collinear spin and spin orbit uh, calculations for a uh, broad range of systems. So I, I believe uh, uh, Fatima, Amir, and Steven uh, will benefit from it as well, and uh, we will uh, share recordings with uh, um, new group members if such. Uh, members will, will appear. So, um,